and I was using some different words. <laughs> and when they were singing that one song, they were just, and I was just singing, set my soul on fire, 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 send down your fire. Y'all uh, y'all were saying something totally different. <laughs> but my heart, my heart desired, I asked the Lord this morning, Please let me teach this right. Please, Daddy, help me with this. This is so beautiful and it's so needed. I said, Daddy, please. So I don't even know what song you guys were singing. It was like I went oblivious to what you were saying and I just kept singing. Set my soul on fire, 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 fire. So that's what I'm praying that the weight of this message. So God, open every ear and every mind to understand what you are saying to your people, oh God. Father, all around the world, all around the country, the people that are tuning in this morning to hear a word from you. God, bless them this morning. Bless every hearer, oh God, that is listening this morning. Open up understanding. Father, you give wisdom to the simple, oh God. Give wisdom today. Open up knowledge, God. Allow your spirit to permeate, God, every concept that we have that is not like you. And bless us this morning, oh God. Father, I ask these things in the name of our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You can give the Lord a hand praise as you're being seated. Hallelujah. for today it comes from Hebrews and it is tempted in every way if you would go with me in your Bibles to Hebrews the second chapter we're just going to jump right on in here we had a presbytery meeting uh, this week and um you know, Shauna said something and it rejuvenated me because her, um, her comment was in us maintaining our core values and that regardless to what other people are doing, uh, whatever part of the vineyard, vineyard that God has given them to work in, that we stay true to our core values, to the things that God planted us in. And, and one of those that has been our motto from the onset is following the move of God. We will follow the move of God whithersoever he leads us. And I shared this with them this morning, and so some of you were not here for prayer, so I want to share it with you, because God has a way of bringing things in perspective. A couple of missionaries were killed this weekend. One of them, a man, uh, beheaded 30 years um, in this country, uh, building orphanage, that's all they did. That's all they did was build orphanage and they beheaded him in front of his wife. Another was a uh, gentleman, a surgeon, and God blessed him and skilled him. And he went, um, and for 25 years, he's been the only surgeon in this country. But because he did it in the name of Jesus, he wanted to take his gift and be able to show the love of Jesus, um, he lost his life. And so um, when Shauna was um, exhorting, that's that exhortation for us to remember that there are believers all around the world who are laying down their lives for the gospel. 
and then we who are so blessed and who are so comfortable, we have a responsibility and we must learn to take our responsibility uh, seriously that we have been entrusted, amen, with a lot. So that being said, Hebrews, the second chapter, I want to talk about Jesus today. I want to talk about Jesus. Hebrews, the second chapter, we will start reading at verse 18. And it says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, um, who is faithful, because I'm down into chapter three now, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house have more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And so I'm gonna talk today about how could God be tempted? Because um, the Bible is clear that he himself suffered uh, so that he could help other people with the same temptation. One of the things that people are very comfortable in saying when it relates to Jesus is that, well, you know, I'm human. As though he came as something different. There is so much emphasis that is placed upon his divinity that the humanness uh, that he came, the price that he paid is often very much overlooked. And so Peter made this very profound statement, and we have talked about it. Peter put it like this. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus, the man, that this same Jesus whom you have crucified, that God had made him both Lord and Christ. So the man Jesus received a deity after the cross. He received his glory, his exaltation, um, his lordship, his Christum after the cross. But the man Jesus, you got to understand, was a man. Because uh, the enemy is perverting this gospel to make you believe that there's no way that you can live like Jesus. After all, he was the son of God. But I need you to understand that Jesus was a man. And that he was tempted in all points like as we are. Go over to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, because uh, the, and I believe the apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. There's a lot of discrepancies. It doesn't matter. It's the gospel. <laughs> but um, he, he makes this emphasis, and, and there is a reason why such an emphasis is made on his humanity. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and drop down with me to verse 15. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. We don't have a high priest who is not familiar with our weaknesses. We don't have a high priest who just is from heaven looking down 
unaware of the things that we go through in these human bodies, but was in all points tempted. In all points, Jesus, in all points, Jesus was tempted like we are, yet without sin. He states that Jesus is tempted in every way that we are. So that if he is tempted just like we are, yet he remained sinless. This is a strong statement and we are comfortable with the Christ part of him. Because that would be like this big old strong grown man and this little boy fighting him. You know how guys, well I, I don't know, I came from a house full of brothers. So some of you might not have seen this, but my older brothers would tell my younger brothers, hit me right here. Bam. Say, man, ain't no hit, hit me again. And so they would hit him, because they was training him. You know, hit me, they put their hand out, hit my hand. Oh, come on, man, ain't no hit. If, if Jesus was like that, if it was just the Christ and the devil, then that would be a fair analogy. But it was not Jesus Christ that resisted the devil. It was Jesus the man. This was Mary's son who was fully aware of the God in him. Just like God is in you. You see, you don't have a miniature version of Christ on the inside of you. You have the Christ. Now, this challenges our faith because as believers, we feel like we have temptations that Christ has not experienced. But the Bible is telling us that we don't have a temptation that the Greek word for temptation is test. That we don't deal with any tests that in the 33 and a half years that Jesus Christ walked the earth that he did not encounter. We will not encounter a single test that he has not experienced. Now, we know in the, in, in the book of Hebrews, it says, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. That as a man growing up, when we think of tests, we're thinking of the things that we want to do, that there is something that prohibit us from doing or something that we are supposed to do that we don't want to do. Other than that, it would be a test. It's one or the other. Either I want to do it, and I am prohibited from doing it, that makes it a test. So, James said that no man can serve two masters. He said he's either going to love the one and hate the other. So we have these um, tests. Abraham was tested with his son to test his attitude, his trust, his faith in God. God says, take your son, the only one you got that you love. Because God didn't want Abraham to be confused. Is he talking about the one I love or he talking about another son? He said, no, 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 no. Let me clarify. Take your only son, the one whom you love. Take him. And I want you to sacrifice him. And when Abraham was willing to do that, he passed the test. 
some tests, temptations, to see if we will remain faithful when there's nothing to win. You know, everybody, <laughs> everybody will do things when there are plenty of accolades, plenty of attaboys, good job, great going. But like our beloved brothers who were martyred over the weekend for Christ, we didn't know them. They were not doing the work that they were doing for accolades. They were given a task, an assignment from God, and they put their hands to do it. James put it this way. He says, if you are a friend of the world, you are the enemy of God. And so the Bible stating that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, yet he remained obedient. And, and we talked about this, because I'm going somewhere with this. We talked about his obedience. We talked about him always being in subjection to the Father. Not that every time he wanted to do it. It never says that. It says every time he did it. All of us should have had some kind of experience where the Lord has asked us to do something. We didn't want to do it, but we did. It. And that's the part that mattered. So when it's talking about Jesus being tempted, in Matthew, after he had fasted for 40 days, the Bible says he was hungry. Because when we're talking about being tested is having the desire to do something. Having the desire to do something is not the sin. Okay. I can desire food. Food is necessary. My desire becomes illegal when I desire your food and I make a plan to get it. Okay, the desire in itself, we can desire comfortable things, we can desire homes, we can desire things, but when I rob God to get it, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so when Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, but without sin means the man had desires. He was not without desires. He, he was aware of the world around him. He was aware and he had desires. Go with me to 1 John. First John, way at the back of the book, the second chapter, drop down to verse 16. It says, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So he said it is the lust, the other word for lust is desire. So the lust or the desires of the flesh, that has to do with our appetites. All of our appetites, not just eating appetites. We, we got appetites for other stuff. <laughs> we got lots of appetites for other stuff. And the lust or the desire of our eyes and what that is, is our own perception of what we need. 
when we're talking about um, the, the lust of the eye, it is talking about a perception of what I need. Because sometimes you perceive you need something and you're willing to do some stuff only to find out you didn't really need that. So it never was a need. It was a false perception. So the lust of the eye has to do with our own perception of what we need because God already promised to supply all our need. Then the pride of life that has to do with the power, with the prestige, with the honor and the things that we desire. So if Jesus was tempted in every place like we are, then he had to be tempted with these things. He had to be tempted with appetites. He had to be tempted with the perception of what he needed. He had to be tempted with prestige, with honor, with being exalted of himself. So, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, this is what happens. The Bible says when John the Baptist saw him, he declared, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And he baptized him and that the spirit of the Lord uh, landed upon him bodily and immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Now in this wilderness, um, God called a fast. And God told him, fast. So then the Bible makes a point of letting us know that after 40 days and nights, here comes the devil. And so he begins to uh, tempt Jesus and he begins to attack his reasoning. He is not attacking the Christ. Christ doesn't get hungry. Okay, this is Jesus the man. This is Jesus the man who is now coming off of a 40 day fast and the enemy understands the prophetic word that is over this man's life. The enemy was quite aware that he'd been born. All right? So we know that he knows who this is he's dealing with. So he tells them to go ahead and command these rocks to be bread. Because you know God don't want you hungry like this. And you know you got the power to do it. And I want you to see something here. Because Israel, God's son, had these same challenges. Israel, after receiving the same introduction that Christ did a miraculous birth, Israel was in bondage, a miraculous birth, and into the wilderness. And after being in the wilderness for three days, not 40, <laughs> after three days, Israel said, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here for the specific purpose of killing me? But Jesus, the man, after 40 days and nights, said man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, I don't know what's the longest period of time you fasted. I can't say. Whatever it is, at the end of it, you was hungry. And you was not reaching for your Bible when the fast was over. <laughs> you had made preparation before the end of that fast what, where, and how much you were going to be consuming. It is an appetite. It is a desire that Jesus had to feel to be able to understand 
when our desires are great. Can I be plain? Is that all right? Because we have all kinds of appetites. We have all types of sexual appetites. Affection appetites. Touch me, feel me, hold me, caress me. All types of appetites of the flesh. They are fleshly. That we must bring our bodies into subjection. And Jesus had to do this. He had to experience what it was like to tell his appetite no. To say no. Then, when the enemy saw that this was not a test that he was going to fail, he began to attack God's providential care. Can you trust? Because this is a concern for saints. This is the main reason people don't pay tithes. Will God care for me? Will God protect me when I cannot protect myself? Because I've done the mathematics and this is not going to work. There's no way I can do this. And, and it's an attack that you must learn to overcome. So he came to Jesus. He says, well, you know, it's written that he's got angels and that those angels will protect you from dashing your foot. But are you sure about that? Throw yourself and see if this thing is true. Go ahead and throw yourself over the, 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 the uh, cliff here and see if these angels will protect you. Because they're not going to protect you here because Jesus was aware what was ahead. He was aware that the cross was up the road. God made Paul aware. Let me show you what great things you're going to suffer. So that you don't feel like you got sidetracked. Let me show you what this thing is about. So Jesus knew his destiny was the resurrection. But to get through the resurrection, he had to get through the cross. So here is Satan now. You know, that's some big stuff God's asking you to do. You know, this. So go ahead and see if it's true by throwing yourself off these rocks. You got to understand what was going on. Nope. I'm not going to do it. I will not test God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm not buying this trick. So then he comes to him with the pride of life. Let me show you all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus. And you and me got to go to the cross to get this. Ain't nobody going to beat you. Ain't nobody going to spit in your face. Ain't nobody going to snatch out your beard. You don't have to get your back beat out. You don't have to be pierced in your side. You don't have to have somebody strip you naked and nail you to a cross in front of scorners. Only thing you got to do is one little thing. That's all I'm asking you to do. And you know, you know the Father loves you. So just go ahead and bow down. And then bam, it's yours. <laughs> now people make these decisions every day. They make these decisions every day to bow down. They bow down in the gospel. They bow down in churches. Well, you know, you, you know, you know, really, you know, when you think about it, you know, the Bible say, you know, we good for wrapping some scripture around something. The Bible say he will withhold no good thing. So I'm, I, I just believe it's the Lord. No, you don't. You are talking yourself into believing something that you know is out of season to be yours. So Jesus 
demonstrated what a true son does. Because he was a true son. Excuse me. He demonstrates to us because Israel did the exact opposite at every single place where she was tempted. The Lord tested her. He says, look, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to take you here. I'm going to destroy your enemies. I'm going to fight for you. I don't want you to mingle with their gods. Don't let your sons marry their daughters. Don't let your daughters marry their sons. All you have to do is stay pure. <laughs> and they married the Moabite women, and they brought a curse upon their people. And there are things that God tells us not to do. And the same problem that Israel had is the same problem we have because God is not quick with retribution. Because he is long-suffering. And because he's long-suffering, we think that what we're doing is okay. God said, listen, I'm going to take you into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Don't serve these gods. And that was the final thing. When God got ready to take them to the land, they said, God's lying. Uh, they, they are too big for us. God lied because we're like grasshoppers and they're like giants. God lied again. But Jesus remained a faithful son. Every test that Israel had God allowed his son to pass it. So we come to this place where we're looking at our example and we have to say, then what makes us fail the test that Jesus the man was able to pass? Go to James the first chapter. Because it's very different when we speak about him as a man. Because he got cold. He got lonely. He was isolated. He was rejected. He lived in poverty. He wasn't going around in chariots. He was walking in dusty sandals. James puts it like this. Chapter 1. Drop down to verse 14. He says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. And sin when it is finished. You see, in the process, sin doesn't look like it's going to produce death. Yes. This is how people shack it up. Right. Because they're in the process of sin, and it does not yet appear what the end is going to be. So in the process, this looks good. Because it is, a, it is in motion. It is in motion, and when it is complete, when that sin brings forth fruit, the fruit of it will be death. He says that every man is tested when he is drawn away of his own desires. Because when we think lust, we often think of something like, Pornography, <laughs> lust, you know, something where, but I want you to think of your lust as desiring things. 
when you are drawn away with your desires that I gotta have it. I have to have it. I need it. I need it. I need it. Now, let me show you where we got this from. Y'all know this scripture, but we're going to read it again. Go to Genesis, the third chapter. Because our desires, our desires,